The lungs are a major hindrance for the use of ultrasound at the thoracic level. That was what we learned not so long time ago. As a matter of fact, as a cardiologist, I always hated the lung because it prevented me from seeing the heart. In reality, lung ultrasound now has a very firm place in the armatorium of ultrasound, especially now when it comes to imaging patients who have COVID-19 infection. Welcome to this lecture on lung ultrasound and welcome Martin Altersberger. Thank you very much. But lung ultrasound is being used for quite some time already. The physicists started in 1961 to use ultrasound and scanning the lungs. They were aware of the fact that they can interpret artifacts. In medicine, we started doing research on lung ultrasound approximately 1983. But what are the indications for lung ultrasound? The indications start, of course, with dyspnea, patients in shock, hypotension, hypertension, but basically lung ultrasound should be used when you do a physical examination. Of course, we know the anatomy of the respiratory tract. We have the trachea and then we have 300 million alveoli. So this is the organ we use for breathing. But there's also a problem with lung ultrasound. Even though we are able to image the lungs itself, we still have the barrier of the ribs. So be aware that when we perform an exam, we always have to peek through the intercostal spaces. What we can see here is a handheld ultrasound device. With this device, you can perform lung ultrasound. You can use each and every machine, but especially in COVID-19 infection, we have to be aware of the fact that hygiene is tremendously important, not only for our patients, but also for us as healthcare professionals. For lung ultrasound, what you need is a machine and basically you can use every machine there is on the market. Also, point of care or handheld devices. That's absolutely true and they definitely have their advantages. You can use them bedside, you can bring them into the intensive care unit. Uh, they're also easy to use in an environment now as we have it in COVID-19 infection. So definitely lung ultrasound is a technique which offers a lot of possibilities. But what will we offer you in this free lecture series? Of course, we will show you the normal findings of lung ultrasound. We will talk about prolifusions like this over here. We will see how atelectasis looks like, this waving motion of the lung. We will talk about interstitial syndromes, so many B lines. We will talk about consolidation as seen in this image, a huge pneumonia. We will talk about viral diseases as well, also COVID-19. And we are going to discuss ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. What can we actually see in lung ultrasound? So you see, all of these topics are very, very important and I would say at the moment on the top of our list. But let's talk first about the COVID-19 pandemic. I guess all of you are aware that it's the lung which is primarily affected. And if we want to get some information about the lung, we will need some form of imaging. Of course, CT is a fantastic way of looking at it, but it's not the ideal technology. And our colleagues from Italy and places around the world who've been hit hardest have confirmed that CT is not the technique to go simply because it's very, very difficult to bring patients under these circumstances into CT. The availability is not high and ultimately CT can, of course, help to establish the diagnosis, but the diagnosis is usually clear with other modalities and with the clinical exam anyway. But what are the advantages of lung ultrasound? Well, we can definitely determine whether or not the patient has a pleural effusion and be aware that patients with COVID-19 rarely have pleural effusion. So it's a way of finding other causes of lung disease or problems. We can also see or rule out larger consolidations and with lung ultrasound, we also can determine how to change therapy in patients who have a COVID-19 pneumonia. Exactly, because in such patients, we usually see a very wet lung and we can see the wetness, I would say, of the lung with the help of ultrasound. 
But before we talk more about pathologies, let's see how we have to position the patient to actually perform a scan of the lung. If you perform lung ultrasound, you can simply ask your patient to sit down. Thank you very much. Or you can also place your patient in a supine position. Can you lie down, please? Thank you very much. If you work on an intensive care unit or in an emergency department, most of your patients might be in a supine position anyways. Keep in mind, if you have to change the position of the patient, for example, to a left lateral or a right lateral position, or even in a prone position, you still can image the lung. But let's now see how to actually perform ultrasound. Where should we image the lung? We can divide each lung, each hemithorax into four areas. Area one, two, three, and four. We use the parasternal line, the anterior axillary line, and the posterior axillary line to divide each hemithorax and then the midline of the thorax. And we continue to just scanning the lung on the right side and also on the left side, of course. And we have to make sure that we scan as many intercostal spaces as possible. The more we scan, the more we see, of course. If we do a really thorough exam and use a lawnmower approach, so scan everything we can see, we can cover approximately 7% of the surface of the lungs. But definitely it takes some time. We want to be really, really exact and thorough. So this is an important teaching point up front. Now let's go to our device and see which transducers we have available. If you perform lung ultrasound, it's very important to know that you can basically use any kind of transducer and any kind of machine you like. You can use a convex probe. So here the convex probe, it's used for greater depths. You can use a cardiac probe, here you see the smaller surface, or you can use a linear transducer. Be aware that you should use a transducer where you have a specific lung preset. For the detection of pleurifusion, use a convex probe or the cardiac probe. If you are interpreting lung sliding or, for example, small consolidations, you should use a linear transducer because you have a really high resolution, but no great depth. To summarize, use your machine, get used to your machine, and always use the same settings. And now we have seen the instrumentation. It's time to see a patient. Yes. In case of scanning the patient in a supine position to look for a pleurifusion or a consolidation, place the transducer just in the mid axillary line and you will see the liver in the center. Here you see the kidney and it basically resembles a right upper quadrant view of the EFAST exam. What can we do now to scan for a prelifusion? We just have to move crania, we have to use enough gel and as dorsally as possible and then again inhale and exhale. Thank you very much. What we can see here is the curtain phenomenon. So lung, aerated lung, exhale. But we also see if we exhale, freeze the image. Here we see a so-called mirror artifact. Don't mistake that with the consolidation. This is just a mirror image of the liver. And finally, where would you actually see a pleurifusion? always look in the near field first. So in that region over here, if there would be a black area, so echo-free area, that would resemble pleural effusion. As we have seen in the demonstration, we can take a look at the right upper quadrant view. We see the right kidney and the liver, and then we just move more cranial and more dorsal. And then we are basically imaging the zone Four. Here we see the liver, here the pleura, there is even already a beeline. Here is the mirror artifact. So we have the diaphragm and here the mirrored liver in the lung. We can visualize 
this curtain phenomena, so the lung moving towards the liver and over the liver, if we zoom in, we really can be sure that there is no pleural effusion present. So always look in the near field. In the near field, here would be an echo free, so a black area, if there would be a pleural effusion present. Let's turn to the left side and to our patient again. In case you want to detect a pleural effusion on the left side in a supine position patient, Basically, you do the same as on the right side. You position the transducer at the mid-axillary line and you see the kidney quite nicely and the spleen, also rib and rib shadow, and you move crania and dorsal. So as cranial and dorsal as necessary until you see again this curtain phenomena. And can you please inhale and exhale? Where would you detect the pleural effusion? Again, look in the near field where you see the pleura and the spleen in this case. Also be aware on the left side, ribs and rib shadow block a little bit more of our view to the spleen compared to the right side of the liver. But Martin, how is the left side different from the right? The biggest difference of course is that on the left side there is the spleen and on the right side there is the liver. So on the left side, the spleen is normally smaller than the liver. So with the transducer, we have to move more crania and dorsal to detect the prolifusion if it is present. So let's take a look at the left side. We see the left kidney over here and there already you see the lung. If you move more crania with the transducer, we see again this curtain phenomena. And here we have a nice image of the spleen. And you see here, that's pleura and in the near field you would see a black area, so echo-free area, if there would be a pleural effusion. And this is definitely a pleural effusion. This is on the right side. You can see the diaphragma very nicely and you can see that the fluid within the pleural sac is almost completely loosened. We do see a little bit of speckles there, but in general it's almost black. You can even see the so-called spine sign. If you look on the bottom of the image, you see the spine. And the appearance of this pleural effusion will already tell you very, very much about the etiology of the problem. Whereas in this example, the pleural effusion looks entirely different. What can we see here? We see black areas over here, but we see this white hyperechoic lines which are sometimes moving, this is a so-called exudent. So this is suggestive of a bacterial infection. All right, so what you're seeing here is fibrin basically. You see that there is probably some form of hemorrhagic, infectious material inside. What is the physiology behind a transudet and an exudet? In a transudet we have this clear effusion. It is due to increased hydrostatic pressure, for example, in congestive heart failure, or a reduced colloid osmotic pressure, for example, in liver disease, because there's a lack in protein synthesis, or we have protein loss if you have kidney disease. In an exudate, we have this capillary leakage. So there are a lot of proteins, a lot of cells inside the fluid, and they create this fibrinous structures. This is most likely an inflammation or a tumor. Very frequently a bacterial inf infection or for example tuberculosis. To differentiate the etiology again, a transudet could be due to right heart failure, nephrotic syndrome or liver cirrhosis. Pulmonary embolism can also be responsible for a transudet, but in up to 80% of the cases in pulmonary embolism you will see an exudet. Exudate is also present in pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, in malignant diseases, or as you mentioned, tuberculosis. But there's a finding which is practically always associated with a pleural effusion, and that is atelectasis. Atelectasis is nothing else than just compressed lung tissue. It is normally present in really large effusions. It is re-aerated when the patient inhales as you can see in this loop as well. So you see that 
this area gets a little bit broader and it moves like a waving hand. So that's very typical for atelectasis. In complicated pleural effusions, we see, as we have seen in the examples before, fibrinous structures. This was a pneumonia with a multi-resistant staph aureus. In this case, it is more subtle. You have to pay close attention, but this is also a complicated diffusion. You see some fibrin fibers over here and also in the deeper areas and a consolidation over here. This as well is pneumonia. And sometimes you'll see real chambered effusions. And if you tap such an effusion and wonder why you do not get any fluids out, if you use ultrasound, you'll better understand because maybe you're just in one chamber and not able to drain the entire amount of the fluid which is in the pleural sac. But of course, for diagnostic purposes as well, use ultrasound to really hit the chamber and not just fibrinous tissue. In pleural effusion, if you see a complicated effusion, you always have to be aware about the etiology. So infectious or malignant diseases. Always look where you have positioned your transducer. Don't mistake in a hydronephrosis, grade 4, for a complicated effusion. Lung ultrasound can even detect really small amounts of free fluid, 10 to 15 ml. In chest x-ray, we need 250 ml to detect a pleural effusion. Ultrasound is optimal for guidance of a procedure such as thoracosynthesis and it is also very important that you can monitor the effusions with ultrasound. So if you, for example, give a patient diuretics or antibiotics, you can see that the effusion becomes smaller, stays the same, or even becomes larger. So I guess you've seen there's very much we can learn from lung ultrasound. We've only covered a very small part of the topics that we're going to cover. In the second part, we're going to talk about pneumonia, how to scan patients on an ICU, and we will also show you some real patients with COVID-19 infection. So stay tuned.